guys and gals. Um, this is the Annapolis Startup Meetup it's for entrepreneurs and startup companies and everybody with creative ideas. So we appreciate you coming out. First, before we get started, I want to thank all of our sponsors. Um, first and foremost, um, O'Callaghan Hotels, who always host us here graciously. Um, if you have folks coming into town or you need a place to stay in Annapolis, I definitely recommend this hotel. Um, secondly, I'd like to also thank uh, Tara, Tara Robertson, um, Roberts, sorry, uh, Moosey Productions. And um, she's been shooting the, the videography and photography for us. And um, it's turned out really good. If you guys have watched any of the videos of um, the events or looked at any of the photography, it's really good. I know Tara's uh, gotten some, um, some clients from this group and then the, the results have been really good. Do you want to say a few words or about what you're doing or any current projects you're working on? You're just back from vacation, right? I'm just back from vacation. Right. I went up to New England to visit family, three little nephews. Um, but yeah, back in town and back at work. Um, for the last, I guess, five or six months, I've been filming the speakers, and then on the off months, during the happy hour, I take photos of people socializing, and they put them up on their website. Um, I just finished a video for um, an HR company that was a, uh, a, a graphic um, motion, I, I guess, which was a bit of a challenge, because the most graphic motion I'd ever done was like a logo making it go woof, but I had a whole 90 second <laughs> piece to put together for this HR uh, company and uh, I was really happy with how it turned out. So yeah, I just do video for local businesses and um, sporting events, etc, etc. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. You know, we appreciate you. Um, I'd also like to thank the Annapolis Economic <coughs> Development Corporation. I don't think anybody's here. I didn't see anybody here from, from there today, but um, you know, we work hand in hand with them. They, they've been a huge help and, they, and they're working on the, um, the co-working space that we're putting together in Annapolis. So, um, you know, when you see those guys, um, also they have an event coming up next month that we're always a part of. So um, they're always a big help. Um, and then lastly, I want to thank um, GM Investments. Um, is Jim here? Where's Jim? Oh, there he is. Um, Jim Gibbons and GM Investments are always great supporters of this. So let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, guys. And, and I am a non techie, so Terry, you better make this good for me, all right? <laughs> um, hey, listen, uh, I'm Jim Gibbons. I'm partner, portfolio manager at GM Investment Group. And what we do is we advise design and manage portfolios for, for our clients, all right? And what we do, quite frankly, is we do everything in-house. We're not going to farm out your portfolio to some overpaid Wall Street manager with subpar performance, all right? What we do is we get into what we call invest in strength. And invest in strength is our methodology. It's a ranking system, all right? So we can look at any part of the market, rank it, and we just want to be in the top parts of that market. We don't care about the bottom parts like the entire S&P. Just invest in the best parts of the S&P and you'll find your performance will, will, will come thereafter. But I appreciate being part of this group. This is a great group, by the way. We're trying to put Annapolis on the map. These guys are doing a wonderful job with it. So actually, I want to give a round of applause to these guys right here. What's going on? Business Workshop. Um, who here has an idea but hasn't formed a company yet? Jordan. Yeah, I know all about it. All right, good, 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 good. All right, and, and for those that have formed, that's where we come in. But it's going to be a two-day workshop. This workshop is going to be great. It's um, it's Tech Biz Workshop. It's going to be uh, October 31st, November 1st, and it's a two-day deal. Um, for those that haven't formed, you want to do the two days. For those that have formed, the second day is probably where you're going to want to come in. Um, I have to cheat here to give you all the good information. But this workshop. Second day is where you're going to find protecting your intellectual property. You're going to get the smart, efficient, and safe HR system that you need. So then you're starting to get into after you form, HR becomes a little more important. That's where we come in. So we're going to design a retirement plan to help attract and retain employees. Then last is protect your assets, or protect your ass in some cases. This is insurance, folks. And for those with a, a tech company, um, diversified Insurance, Melissa Burke is going to be the presenter there, is one of the, one of the, the folks, the pioneers in uh, cyber insurance. So those that have a lot of data on the web, um, 
or you know, dealing between servers and so forth and lost client data, breaches of cybersecurity, you know, that's, a, that's a big deal these days. So that's going to be Melissa's part of the program. So the second day, that's November 1st, but um, you can find all this information at uh, Tech Combustion or just take a flyer on, that, on outside there. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Yeah, I'd like to know if, I didn't, if I didn't thank Tony Bagnon, who um, is uh, the creator of this group and, and organizes everything. So thanks a lot. Brian does it all. <laughs> um, does anyone else have any good events coming up or anything? Else, anything you guys want to shout out? Anything? No? Um, the next event that we have coming up is on November 21st. So mark your calendars. Um, we always do every other month. So we do this meeting every other month, and then every other month from that we do a networking um, happy hour before the Annapolis Economic Development Corporation's meeting where they do um, entrepreneurs and inventors program where they have two companies come up and pitch their companies and then they have a featured speaker. It's always amazing and it's been getting better and better each month. So um, you know, mark that down in your calendars and, and come out for that. Um, so the Annapolis Startup Meetup is all about entrepreneurs. It's, it, it's, it's all about creative thinking. And um, you know, one of the big parts of that is when you come up with that idea, what do you do? Well, you should definitely attend workshops like the one that Jim was talking about to get more information. And then what, what do you do, though, if you have a software idea, but you're not a software programmer? And that's the topic of what we're talking about. Let's say you don't know how to develop software. Well, where do you even start? Who do you talk to? Well, some really good folks to talk to are Tony and Terry at Bite Line. And, um, and so, um, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But before that, I did want to have um, uh, Will come up. Where's Will? Is he here? Uh, come on up. Um, so, Will Schweitzer is the executive vice president of Haven. And one of the things that we like to do before, um, you know, before the event begins is give an entrepreneur that's a member here a chance to kind of talk about their business. And just a quick acapella pitch, a few minutes. So, Will, uh, take the floor and tell us about Haven. Thanks. So Haven is a home management and concierge services company that's based here in Annapolis. We opened up shop uh, January of this year. We have seven employees now. Um, we work with several homes here in Annapolis, Columbia, and we work with a 584 unit condominium community in Dulles. But as a way of telling you what we do, or before I tell you what you do, I'd like you to think of some great fictional characters, some of the most beloved people ever. and. Depending on your generation, how old you are, I'm sure Alfred from Batman came to mind. Um, quite possibly Jeeves from a great British comedy, uh, or even Carson from Downton Abbey. These characters are all in support roles, both in plot and what they do. They're trusted, they're dedicated, they're beloved. They take care of anything and everything from dispatching villains to folding laundry. And I think for us at Haven, they're the perfect example of a servile brand. Um, what we do for our clients, if you are a private homeowner, we'll come into your house, we'll inspect the interior and exterior of your home on a regular basis. We'll make sure everything's in proper working order. Uh, if you are a vacation homeowner, we'll open and close your homes. We'll stock the kitchen before you arrive. And then we get into our personal concierge services, which can be absolutely anything under the sun. It's personal shopping, it's event planning. Uh, the big thing is a lot of these tasks are routine, and we hope to bring quality to service. So if we think of Carson and Downton Abbey, it's really taking those tasks and making an art form and that's the service we want to bring back to things that have become commoditized. So we exist somewhere between task rabbit and hiring a home butler for your house, which could be $200,000. Um, for commercial services, we found, are trying to find that sweet spot as well. You can hire a temp agency or a security company to be at your front desk, you're paying someone minimum wage. Or you can roll in a very big tech solution and have professional staff, but that's a really large investment. Uh, for a condominium community. So we hope to find a middle ground there as well. Um, be glad to talk to anyone about what we do. We found a lot of support in this Annapolis community, everything from our lawyers to our accounting firms. We've reached, I think, a lot of small businesses through this group in town, uh, and it's a great place to be. And I'd love to give you a brochure if you're at all interested. So, thank you. Oh, that was perfect. Thank you. I agree, Annapolis is a great place to be. You know? Um, you know, we're definitely, um, as Jim was saying, putting, trying to put Annapolis on the map as far as it being a destination for creativity and entrepreneurship and businesses. 
um, you know, I was born and raised here, and, and I love being here, I love living here, and I've had to found myself having to go to D.C. and Baltimore um, to kind of be a part of the tech and entrepreneurial community. So it's good to, that you guys come out and support this, and we're looking to spread the word about this, to, to grow this group, because it really is about getting out and, and being inspired by what others are doing, because oftentimes as an entrepreneur, you might be starting something up or just have an idea, and it's inspiring to be around other folks that are active and doing things. I always walk out of these meetings with more energy than when I came into them, so that's really cool. Thanks for coming out. Um, so what I'd like to do now is um, introduce um, Terry McGregor, who um, is a Naval Academy grad, Annapolis guy. Um, graduated from the Naval Academy with um, a BS in computer science, and also from Johns Hopkins with a master's in computer science. This guy knows what he's talking about. He's developed software, everything from simple software up to the most complicated kind of software. So when it comes to explaining the process and walking you through that, I don't think there's anybody better that we could have gotten. So um, Terry, want to take it over? And, and yeah, sure. Cool. Thank you, Ryan, for the very kind introduction. All right. So I am the quintessential uh, embarrassing dad. So I'm going to start off with a couple of uh, bad jokes. It's going to tie into the overall theme of the presentation here. But uh, hey, does anybody know what kind of uh, grades pirates got when they were in high school? Ours. Ours. No. High C's. <laughs> Not bad, okay. All right. So, these are a couple reasons about why you should listen to me. Ryan took the, the first one, is two degrees computer science. Uh, I am a Naval Academy grad. This is actually a man that I had to face uh, my plea, plea year. Uh, he's real. <laughs> you know, I kept trying to find that guy, but I could never find him. I don't know what happened to him. Um, but. I've been coding since 1998. Um, yeah, this friend was around. I don't think I watched it back then, but um, but yeah, it was a uh, for a long time. I've been doing this. I've seen a lot of uh, different uh, pieces of technology coming come and go. Now this is interesting. I've 14 uh, built 14 su successfully built external startup applications, and that's for uh, two of them were for a company uh, for an already established company, which was AT and T, and the rest were all startup companies. Now, if you notice that it doesn't say successful startups, it says successfully built their applications. Uh, whether the company succeeds or not, I, I really have no control over that. But, um, but I've seen a lot of things and uh, watched a lot of, uh, you know, we'll talk about that as we go through. And, and I read computer books too, so that's, uh, that's another reason why you should, should listen to me. Now, these are reasons why you should not listen to me. Uh, so, I'm a stranger, a lot, of, a lot of you in the room have never met me before, so I usually look at new people, at people I don't know, I'm kind of always skeptical of them, so I would, I would be skeptical of me. Um, and this is, you know, you can't tell, so we, we talk about it, right, I've got a couple of degrees in computer science, but you can't really tell if I'm good at what I do either. So it's kind of like, you know, as we talk about it, hopefully, you know, I can, I can change your mind. Um, and I also associate with this guy over here in the corner, Tony Bagman, if anybody has met him. And, and then also, I'm a services company, so I'm a little bit biased, like I make my money by building software. So as I talk about these recommendations, you know, I'm trying to make them very pure, but you should be aware that, you know, I'm sure you guys are already aware that this is how I make my living. So, okay, so we're going to do, we're going to go over this application roadmap. Um, we're going to follow the cow. We're going to talk a little bit about Lean Startup. Uh, work, and then we're going to do the. This is the really, this is the really interesting one. Choose your own developer adventure, and this is where we're going to talk about how to hire a team. Whether you hire them locally or you outsource, or you do some kind of hybrid. And then the boring but important stuff. It's really boring, but I'll try to make it fun, and hopefully we can like ask some questions as we go through. Actually, you can stop me anytime to ask me anything. I will answer. So this is the roadmap. I'm going to walk you through all these steps. We're going to start with the hypothesis. And we'll talk about here we get to the building the team, you know, designing the app, and then how you how you will uh, both build and launch it. And this is going to be a test case. This is a, a, an application. I actually took some time off last summer to build this, and we're going to go through. And, you know, as I kind of not only talk about this hypothetical, like, hey, here's a map. You know, this is how you build software. But I'm actually going to take you guys through this 
and, um, and kind of show you how it all fits together as we go. Um, hundreds of users, it is, a, it is a working web application, and I'll go ahead and pull it up so you guys can see what this is. Um, let me just do a quick, uh, quick connection. So what this, so, so everybody who knows, um, actually let me, let me flip back. I'm on Tony's computer, so I'm not sure how the login's gonna go. But, so, so this is a, an app that was to try to like track people's commutes and tell them how bad their life was. <laughs> you can see the cow, <laughs> he, he gets angrier, and then he has a happiness score over here. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so I commuted for a long time and I, I hated it, so that's why I started this. Uh, I thought it would change the world, right? <laughs> And after building all these startups for all these other people, oh good. So I logged into uh, Tony's account, and if you look in here, you know now we logged in. Uh, you can see the financial cost of your commute. You know uh, how much time you're losing. Your social impact, right? Your social value drops as you <laughs> sit in the car more. <laughs> so sun exposure. I'm sorry. I guess this got all jumbled up because of uh, Tony's computer. Nothing to do with the technology. <laughs> and uh, so what you look at the sun exposure is you know people have their arm out the window, right, and they're driving. Well, like half the, their arm is actually exposed and half their face is. So that I mean, th there's a bunch of things, including the, the weight. Here's a little calendar guy. He's, he's gaining calories because he's in the car. So, um, so it was a pretty, it was a pretty, you know, complete application. Like, you know, here's a, a search tool you could use to figure out like where you lived and it would find like where where people, you know, how you could find people to commute with. Like, this is your destination over here. This is your home location. And then uh, of course, uh, couch apps. Tony didn't have any mobile apps, but there is a mobile app over here. And uh, this is an Android app that would let you track your, your trip and plot it all out for you so you could look at it. Okay. So that was done. I did that in the summer. I took some time off. Okay. So back to the. Oh, sorry, guys. What did you build it in? Uh, who asked that question? Oh, you. Uh, we actually did that in Ruby on Rails. And then I. Yeah, I'll talk about that technology stack. Uh, that's a. Fits into the whole. The, the development side. So uh, hypothesis. So this is the, like. So if you have an idea, this is what like ideally you know. Let's say I'm a developer. And you wanna. You wanna. You know hire me for equity to go work on a project or you just want to hire me in general. This is, this is what I really want people to do is sit down and say, what, what's your hypothesis? Because you, be, you want to be able to prove something. You want to say like, hey, I think that everyone's going to want to commute, right? And you want to do like, what are, your, uh, what are your leaps of faith assumption? Like, I think if I make this app, people will be able to connect to each other better and people will carpool every day, uh, which is not true. <laughs> Just uh, so you guys know. All right. So I kind of talked about that. You know, I, um, I I thought if I put this all together, uh, this is kind of the roadmap for how I was going to build my application. I actually had a lot more of these hypotheses in here. Um, and then, you know, the bottom line is this is a leap of faith as people will carpool if it's easier. People do not want to carpool, but all right, I'll talk more about that. So, um, so this is the next thing that's really important if you're going to do this kind of work is you know really understand your market. I mean, this is by far the most important thing that you can do as a startup. It's not your technology. I mean, people will say this, and uh, I will say it the most, uh, and I always get like really shocking looks, and sometimes I get rebuked for it, but your technology is a small piece of the business. It's everything that surrounds that, that piece that makes it so important. I mean, the technology, you can, you can hire these functions out and you can build it, but that's really not what's gonna make it. What's gonna make it is your ability to sell the product, uh, what users want and how you're solving pain points. And that's really, really important. And before you do any development or, or even talk about it, like you should have this stuff, you know, figured out on your roadmap. So about, um, you know, how can I make money? I had, long, I had all these great ideas, great <coughs> plans um, about how eventually I would take over all of like indeed.com with my couch at that. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but it's really important though to list all these things out and understand you know, how you're gonna make money in the, in the project before you even start. Okay, so now we talked about that and, and this is now once you understand like what, you know, what your hypotheses are, what your customer validations are, you need to build the absolute minimum amount of code in order to um, prove your idea, to prove that you know, what solution you're trying to solve people actually want to buy. So what does MVP stand for? Oh, that's a great question. I should have laid it out. It's a minimum viable product. Thank you. So, and this is not easy, right? You have to figure out, like, hey, how much do I build? Well, if I build this much, is that going to be great? And if you're not successful, you're like, well, maybe I need to build a little bit more. And it just becomes this very difficult problem to try and, and kind of bound, but you have to do it. Yes. What's your definition of that first success? 
like you have one transaction on your site or? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, here, here's my answer. Uh, for for me, I would I would know it when I <laughs> I would know it when I saw it. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I, I looked at oh, I spent this forever in a year in Google Analytics, and, and that was pretty much a big waste of time. Uh, especially when you're building an application, like you should everything's analytics, all metrics. Like you need to get past a certain threshold that those analytics can actually mean something. So um, that's a really good question, though. That is a very good question. Okay, so, so more, you know, talking about this MVP, you're still list, listing all these features out of what you think it's going to need in order to be very successful. This is a, a tool I'll mention very briefly with JIRA, but the idea is you take those hypotheses and then you break them down into small little workable stories, and then you really can't read that well, but uh, I'm going to read one of them. As a user, I'd like to connect to others to share my commute. And the idea is that you list all these out and you prioritize them, the top ones and the bottom and the lower ones, and you start, you know, you pick a certain point and you say, okay, these top three, that's my MVP. And that's what you would go off and build. Any questions about that? How do you write the how do you user stories? Um, how do you write the user stories? Yeah, give us give us a couple examples. Okay, so like the one I just read. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. So the one I just read is, as a user, I would like to see how my daily commute, uh, how long my daily commute would take. So it's like from a user perspective, yep. how people would see it. So that's how all the stories are kind of written. And I, you, you, you did, <laughs> it was a good question, but I'm just trying to have a good time. Um, okay. So now this is the important part. Um, so once you have this idea laid out and you're going to build this application, you need to say, okay, I need to build a team. And let's say you're doing this by yourself. Let's say you have a couple people. You're kind of, you know, I'm going to assume that sometimes this is all just one person, right? You've got a, a sales guy, a marketing guy, and a product manager. That's, that group really can't be outsourced. Those are your core business functions. So that's going to be your solid team. Now, once you have this application laid out in your head and your mind, you're, really, you're going to need the right skills um, to hire somebody. And this is, this is you, right? So um, you can obtain funding. Yes, Frank. Can you go back one slide? Sure. Um, so I think a lot of people know sales and marketing, but what is a product manager? What, uh, you know, what, how does that? How's yeah. that different than someone that's just oh they're in charge of the product? I mean, can you, can you explain a little bit about what the skill sets? Yeah. Have? So that's a good question. The, the product manager is somebody who really they, they take over that whole product. They understand the complete you know the user's perspective. Like, hey, who's really going to use this thing? You know, how are they going to use it? Um, they understand what the the features are. You know kind of, you know, in real detail uh, what it needs to be successful. That project manager is going to, that product manager is going to make the decisions um, as to what gets built and, and what doesn't in the iterations. And they can successfully prioritize the development that takes place. And a lot of their stakeholders they're answering to are going to be uh, VC, you know, people that are, are funding the company, um, as well as to the users. So they have multiple hats, multiple people that they have to um, work with. Okay, so um, we talked about this, you know, you have this, I'm, I'm assuming you're a one man, I guess I'm going to say a one man person, but you, you know, you've got hustle, you've got, the, you've done the research, you've tamed uh, some uh, funding, and you've got the technical, uh, maybe some technical development experience, maybe just a little bit, you don't have, really have to have that much for, for this presentation. But this is what you need, you're going to need design work for your application, you need software development, you're going to need project management, which is probably the most important thing that's on this. Um, it usually gets... Uh, kind of uh, pushed aside. So, all right, these are the main, this is the smallest team you can, that I will go into a project with. Um, and just, uh, I'm gonna just go over these, these roles very quickly. A lot of these are ha uh, Halloween costumes, can you tell? <laughs> That's a, that time of year. So, the designer is really the person who's gonna lay out the application and make sure, make sure the application looks right and is correct. And, and that's usually a phase in and of itself, and we're gonna go through those phases here pretty soon. But once the designer is done, you're going to need a, a minimum a person devoted to the, the user interface and a developer on the back end, you know, making sure all, you know, just <coughs> database connectivity, building all the logic, all the, all the objects that will support the user's uh, interaction. And then, of course, the project manager, which has a very pivotal role, which is to keep everything kind of flowing on the project. That's a, that's a smallest dev team that, uh, that I will approach a serious project on.
right there. Now, Facebook, I think, was built by one guy, right? I think he was Zuckerberg. He did a lot of this. Uh, that's very rare. But um, is anybody here a developer by any chance? Do you have any developers? Just one? All right. Paul, does that sound about correct to you? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have things like testers and all this other stuff. Yeah. But yeah, to get anything off the ground, you have that separation of concerns. Yeah. Yeah, this is, not a, this is not a trivial piece. Doing this UI development is not trivial, and neither is this back end, and neither is the design work. Um, it's a very difficult, to me, it's a very difficult skill set, uh, especially the design piece. So UI, you're referring to what people see, right? Yes, that's okay. the, either the web app, or if it's going to be a, um, a mobile app, what that user interface is going to look like. Hey, Terry, I mean, yes. do, do people fall into those different roles, those four different roles? That's, that's a great question, too. Um, in general, there's some kind of overlap. So like the UI developer and designer can sometimes overlap. Um, I, I've seen it happen, um, yes. But typically a designer is isolated. That, that is sole function. The worst thing you could do is go to a software developer, <laughs> like a back-end developer, and say, hey, make this project for me, and just make it look good. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's a disaster. Uh, but there's still a lot of work that gets done like that where they just give it to people that don't have the skill. And really, it's design person. I, is anybody a designer in here? Or, no? You are? OK, great. So I mean, I value these people tremendously. Um, they really make products uh, you know, work for people. That's a really good question about the, the, the roles. They do sometimes overlap, but they can't overlap too much at some point, or else it <coughs> it's a little hard. Sure. Could you describe the skill that the developer Sure. What, what skills does he have? Sure. Which one? What, uh, you want to do the UI developer? Develop okay. So the UI developer has to be very comfortable with, you know, understanding, you know, the whole browser domain space. They have to understand. Okay, these are the different versions of browsers that we're going to have. This is how um, inside the browser, the, the browser is really an operating system. That's all I like to think about it. So, you know, how that browser interacts between the page and all the widgets on the particular page. Because if you look at a web page, you might see, okay, it just looks like a like a screen, but inside there's very complex interactions going on that make that thing really pop and, and snap and, and look really sharp. So this guy, he's, he's almost, uh, I almost think of like, like he's, he's doing all the plumbing for that, for that web page to look fantastic. So that's, that's a whole, so I mean, so now specific skill sets, I mean HTML5 are the big ones, uh, CSS cascading style sheets, understanding how, how to import different formats in, so that it looks right, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's responsive in the browser, so if I pull it up on my mobile app, it'll resize to my screen. Those are all skill sets that come in with the, with the user um, interface developer. Sir? On your Caltrip example, yeah. would this have been the team to make that work? Um, yes, except we didn't do much design work. <laughs> the, uh, well, the design work was, was uh, I think we had our UI developer do some of it, and then there was me trying to do some of it. So that's why. I mean, it's not it's not the best, but it's uh, it would have been better had I had a higher designer. But yes. And so, just one more follow-up on that: sure. the time frame from wanting a cow trip at your hypothesis to this team being done. What's that time frame? Yep. So that's a great question too. Um, that for that particular app, it was about uh, two and a half months. But it's really not fair because that <coughs> the whole project started off as an Android project at a hackathon. Mm -hmm. So uh, once I built that Android, I said, okay, I want to build a web platform for this. So, um, but it was about two and a half months to build that web platform. Uh, you know, that's with the and I, I wish I had a whiteboard, but there's almost like a ramp up time, right? You start the project, you build it, and then you wind it down and then let it kind of simmer. So it took about it took about, to get over this main hump that this fictitious hump that I'm drawing. It took about. Uh, about two and a half months. And then everybody's looking for work again. Uh, yes, which is a great, that's a great question. That's going to come up about, like when you, when you build a startup, like if you hire people, it's great, but then you hire them. So when you're out of, when you build the app, you're like, okay, what's next? And you got to keep them working and you got to keep, you know, doing stuff. Um, so one thing we talk about as services company is you don't care. Like if you hire somebody and they're, and they're, they're contract to you, they do the work, and then they, they're done. You don't have any overhead after that. Question? Yes. Would your UI developer uh, be reporting back to the back end developer about things that are problematic that that would 
be better Absolutely. Or yes better that's an ideal differently okay yeah you really want them like you really want these guys talking and the best is if these guys already know each other and they've worked on other projects together then there's no friction it's like hey this is all screwed up oh yeah and they just fix it so uh, <coughs> projects I mean, there's definitely a distinction between design and UX user experience um, where people start to look at the organization of information or how would the person going to interact rather than just the visual aspects and sometimes that kind of spans responsibility right so um, either in this example or in other examples how do you see that fit in such a small team a lot of times people have a dedicated UX type person, but on a small startup team, you wouldn't necessarily want to carry that. Yeah, so that's a really, that's a good point, and, um, and I'm going to speak about that uh, in a couple more slides, because we talk about, you know, I'm a huge believer in, in wireframes, and, um, and when I show those off, like, that gets done before any design work. So it's really getting that functionality working and correct is really important. So that's a great question. A lot of good questions. Okay, so um, this is where you are right now, right? So you know, you know, you want to build this app, but I couldn't think of a better name than Bad Dev Cave. I mean, I, I, I should have been more creative. So it's either so it's either this or this uh, success. Um, and I have been down here before, um, but many more times. This is where this is where I go all the time now. When I first started off, I tried a bunch of things and ended up here. Um, not with Cowchip, this is like years ago. Um, and, and I've been on, really, you know, I was put on teams where, you know, when I first started off my career after leaving the, uh, the, the Navy, this is where most of, the, most of the places I went had a lot of bad, bad devs. So, uh, so I had to like teach myself this, how to, how to make it, how to do it better. Um, so yeah, the, the cost of going down the path of the wrong way is very, very high. But it's still fixable. Okay, so these are, uh, sorry for all the text on this one, but there's four choices here that I list. There's probably like 10 more, but these are the kind of four main ones. Um, I'm going to talk about why you would outsource to a firm like, like Byte Lion, why you would outsource development to individuals like through Odesk, which I've done many times before, um, why, why you would go hire people in-house if you want to build your app, right? And as well, there's this kind of hybrid model where you hire some local technical manager to run some kind of outsourced resources. So I'll talk about all those. This matrix is kind of confusing. Um, I'll make the slides available so people can look at this later. But, but the idea is that what I want to do is try to capture some of the, the key points. And, and here's one where I talk about level of management. And I think, who asked me the question about, like, who asked me the question about like hiring somebody to, yeah, if you hired a team, I think it was you, yeah, they're out of work once the application's built. But, so, so this is kind of uh, talk about this development predict uh, predictability. You, if you're going to have an in-house team, you have to have steady work. So you're going to have to really spin, stretch out over time. Whereas the hybrid, you're in, and when you're outsourcing these things, these things are kind of flexible for you. But there's also, you know, there, there's there's give and takes for all these different models. And I'm not going to walk through them. I'm going to just hit the highlights here in a second or two. Um, so this is when you hire a, a design firm. Uh, or, or not a design, but just when you would hire a, a, tech, a technology firm like Byte Lion. And this is like your team has, uh, yeah, so you don't, your team's kind of new, they don't know like how to do the software piece, so they come in and they say, okay, Byte Lion, just take it for us. And, and then Byte Lion would run the whole project from start to finish and basically, you know, resolve all the issues. And, you know, it's easy to hire a software <coughs> firm, but it's hard to hire individual employee uh, developers. So. Um, that's just that's just true. I, I've tried to hire software developers, and it's not always easy. They're kind of a finicky group. Um, which is why and good at software development. what's that? So, which is why they're good at software development. But yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so, so this is what I mean. An outsourced firm they can be more expensive. It depends on uh, which one you go with. Byte Line is not one of those more expensive ones, but they, <laughs> but. Uh, but they can definitely simplify the process, save you time and stress. I have a question then. Sure. On that uh, two and a half, three month project for Cow, you know, Cow trip, trip, if that had been properly uh, described in some kind of request for proposal, how much would your firm have bid to do that? Uh, I will not bid on a fixed 
bid contract. Is that How much would you have quoted to do Caltrip? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Tony, think of a good answer. <laughs> um, so let me let me take a quick break because that's a great question, and this is a model that we were doing for a while, but we found out that it really wasn't working that well. And uh, BiteLion.com, which is okay. So we had this kind of this is what this is the the, the model we were running, where we would build a startup for twenty two thousand dollars. We would you know this is like a web application, right? You know, we would build a certain amount of features. So we would give you CowChip, but maybe it definitely would not have had the mobile piece to it, and it would have been a streamlined version of, of what CowChip was. And that's kind of what we were, kind of what we were doing, you know, along this path. Um, and then you have this pro model, which is more turnkey, 45. We would kind of have everything all complete. So, so already that looks uh, very competitive to trying to do one of those um, things on the chart that you went through so fast. Oh, I'm like, sorry, know, which was, one? Remember the bad ideas on the nicest looking chart you had about hiring all the developers yourself or trying to do something? This already looks more competitive to doing something like that if you're going to pay those guys what they're due in the marketplace today to yeah. go this way. Yes. Yeah. Did you pay him to pitch here? I know. You're, <laughs> what's your name, sir? <laughs> <laughs> He's our plan. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Put him on the third totally row. Good, no. good job. <laughs> no, so, I mean, it, it is, and uh, but we still... You know, there's other things too. Like people are out there, like, well, I want to hire a, somebody, and um, you know, I want them to work as, as equity. I've done that before. I've worked for equity. I, will, I pr pretty much do not want to do that again. <laughs> equity is terrible, um, <laughs> unless unless, you, unless it's like Facebook, and then it's good. But uh, it's like a rock and roll band playing for the exposure. <laughs> yes. Um, so good. I hope that answered. I hope that answered. <laughs> okay, so let me see. Yeah, this and this is going to get uh, this is going to get a little bit boring, but I'm going to try and zip through it so it's a little bit interesting. I hope people have. I really like the questions. That's that's fantastic. So, this is if you're going to hire a team. So now you're going to hire these guys locally and sit with you. Um, so, so this is a big thing. Like you need somebody like a CTO who can manage these guys who, who has done a lot of development. Yes, sir. What's the difference between a development manager and a CTO? Who Nothing. I said CTO, but I mean like a seasoned developer who understands what the process is. You know, they understand that it's not the C level title, but it's like, hey, I can tell you how to do agile scrum, I can tell you how we're going to um, you know, how we're gonna simplify our designs, how we're going to um, basically, instead of building the whole stack out, we're going to thin slice the stack so we reduce our risk. Those, those are the types of things that um, when I talk about developer managers, it's not a lot harder to take away an officer title if you do it. Yeah, get more responsibility. Maybe. <laughs> so, yeah. So I mean, stay away from chiefs and just stick with Indians, right? <laughs> yeah, it's much easier. Well, this is why I, I, I put all Washington. those those titles. I mean, the titles kind of blend together. They don't really. Yeah. I mean. I, I don't really like that title, CTO. It's a business card problem. What's that? It's a business card problem. What, oh, not having a title? <laughs> having a title is a business card problem. Why is that? That's an issue for the business card, not for the people actually doing the work. Oh, uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so another part of this, when you hire a development team, you've got to have enough time to hire. So this means you have to go find the right talent and hire them, which takes time. And then you have to ramp those developers up. Like a lot of times if you hire some guy, he's local, but he might not know that technology or he might not have that experience. So you still have to like develop that developer. Um, and then this is, you know, you have to really accurately, accurately predict your development needs. Because, you know, one thing, it's really hard to scale up, right? So if you need to do a bunch of work like right now, well, by the time you hire people, you know, it just it takes a long time and then you're not gonna be able to finish, you know, that work and then or maybe they finish all that work and then You've got 10 guys on overhead, which is going to crush a company's payroll. Yes. And I would add, just from an HR perspective, a lot of people who, are especially are new to business, you don't know what you don't know. And if you don't know 
what to look for, you often hire people based on the wrong qualifications <coughs> and end up not with the result you had because you didn't know to look for the right things. So that that's especially a consideration in terms of technology because oftentimes people don't even know what to look for, don't know the right questions to ask, et cetera. Yeah, that, that's an awesome point because actually I, I had something like that and I took it off the slide because I was trying to make it shorter. Oh, sorry. But <laughs> no, it was, it's perfect because, well, I mean, it, you know, it's not only like, hey, do you have the right technology stack, but can you get through the interview and poke holes into this guy and find out, like, does he really know what he's talking about or is he just pretending in here? Um, it's a pretty quick thing to find out if someone knows what they're talking about. Like Paul back there, when she started talking about the things he was working on, I knew that guy's an expert back there. <laughs> Sorry, Paul, I didn't mean to call you out. Um, and then there's also this, this idea where you can hire freelancers. Um, I've done this, I've gotten burned so many times. Um, but, so what this is, has anybody used ODESK before? Awesome, okay. I saw, how many, three hands? Is that you? Okay. Elance. Oh, Elance, okay. Elance. What's that? Elance. Oh, Elance as well. So I've done this and here's what I found. Um, what, what, what is ODESK, Elance? So ODESK, is that, is that, a, com is that a website? Yes, mm -hmm. ODESK.com. <clears throat> and what you do is, uh, there are people, uh, People that put their profile up, they say, hey, I'll do this, uh, whatever, this, um, uh, I can do iPhone development for $10 an hour. And you're like, oh, that's great. You know, I'll go <laughs> here, and you pay this guy some money, and he kind of gives you a product, and you're like, okay. And then, um, and it, I've, I've not had much luck, uh, but eventually you can find good people this way, but you have to have time to test developers and be able to go through them on a cycle. And you have to remember that, that you know, you're hiring them temporarily, but they're looking for work all the time. So if they get a good paying gig, you know, they're not going to, you know, if you have a little bit of work for them, their loyalty only lasts so long. But um, in general, the people have been really great. But I found, you know, when I started using like Indian developers, um, well, it's, I mean, it's not, well, I found that like the time difference was really hard. And, and the culture is different than our culture. And it's like, hey, that you know, I heard a lot of times, just no problem. Hmm. And then uh, I was like, okay, great. <laughs> and I would go to sleep and then just not feel that good. And then uh, so anyway, I mean, I've worked with people from the Philippines, uh, uh, Singapore, Pakistan. India, Pakistan. Yep. Yeah, well, actually, I don't think. Um, yeah, probably though. Um, Australia. And <coughs> what I found is that that time zone is an absolute killer too. So um, and then you have to enjoy the complexity of managing remote work. That's a weird. That's a weird trait to have, but some people like it. You know, I kind of enjoyed it. Uh, but here's a problem, though: is a lot of times these developers are kind of isolated. We were developing a product, and we did a great job. We set all the infrastructure up, but the guy wanted to save money, so we started hiring out additional developers. You know, so we had our team. They started hiring additional developers. You know, in India, and talk about killing collaboration. There's no way we could we can meet with that. We can meet with that those different people working. They're all remote, different parts of India working, and it was. Very difficult. So, so this is a hybrid model. I kind of like this model, and this is basically your staff has experience managing software, and what they end up doing is they they outsource the pieces that you know they they either they have a lot of work, so they outsource you know this piece, um, but they're they're kind of aware of everything. I like this because it's the most accountable, and usually these projects having this staff that's experienced makes it a lot easier because they they know what the process is. It's not like something brand new. So this is the hybrid model, and if you look, this is a Prius hybrid. And did you Google that? Did you type? I did. I googled hybrid, it. Hybrid. That's Terry's car. Yes. <laughs> it's not my car. It's not my car. <laughs> yeah. And how I ended up with the, the pirate, the pirate theme is, uh, yeah. I actually made this last night because uh, I was uh, thinking of Annapolis, and last time we were here, one of the kids went out on a like this pirate boat out here. So that's how I got hooked. Um, okay. So take my jacket off. Sorry if this is boring, everybody. Um, I'm going to try and zip through this. This is the, the really this is my my favorite part of the project. Uh, and this is the wireframing piece where you're basically very quickly you're sketching out what the application is going to look like, so you can um, visualize what you know what the process was that you kind of laid out in your MVP. And this is one of the pages. This is that dashboard which you guys already saw. And you can whip these applications together in literally 20 minutes. You can put you could just drag and drop that onto a website save it and you can actually make it somewhat interactive as well and by doing that any questions you have about what should be there and what shouldn't be there just just get completely blown away so on wireframe how much detail goes into that 
Whose responsibility is that? Do you, do you recommend that as the, the product management responsibility? Would you rather, as a developer or designer, where to? Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a good question because well, I, ideally, if, if you're gonna build a startup, it's great for you to throw, I mean, I really think it's great for you to throw a wireframe together to help lay out what you want. But then, uh, about the, the user experience piece, you know, like we have a guy on our team out of, out of actually Europe, out of Europe on, on the Byteline side, who builds uh, VCs. Um, he works with a, uh, sorry, a VC firm in Boston, and all he does is wireframe applications. He just becomes very, very good, very easy at it, and it becomes routine. That's the kind of guy that we want building our UIs, because it takes him no time, and it's, it's very economical for us. So, um, so it's great to have, so to make a, a short story long, it's great to have the, the, the author, of the, the person building the app, do a, do a basic wireframe, but then have that wireframe improved upon. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, this is one of my, my favorite topics, which is branding and design. I have another question. Go yes. back. <laughs> so I know a lot of these answers, but I'm saying, who, is it okay to show the public those wireframes? Do you encourage that? Do you encourage feedback I, at that stage? I do. I think it's a great thing to do. It's a, it's a great piece to get feedback, and it's the cheapest thing to do. Absolutely. Like, you don't have to have your dev team yet. You could even be showing wireframes off. And, um, and that could even be your, your MVP at that point is, well, actually, it's supposed to be working software, but, but that's a great tool that will get people out there using it, interacting with it. So what you're showing right here is an interactive page. Yeah. Well, what if it's nothing like what you're building? Um, what do you mean? Well, I mean, if, I mean, this is all, looks like statistics or whatnot. I mean, if you're building like a video game, how would this compare <coughs> to what you do? Like with this, I, I would be confused. Yeah, sure. That's a that's a good question. Um, I was gonna say we have one app. It's just not like a video game. It's a uh, my dad reads to me. Oh yeah, that, that, that's a good. One. You can walk and throw it up. There. Can I? <laughs> just put it up there. I don't know. I don't know which play or else it's sitting on right now. Is it that's your site? Yeah. Where is it? All right, we'll let Tony find it. Yeah. So um, so that's a good point though. But a lot of times, what you can find is the uh, like. For the, for the mobile development, it's a piece of cake. There's lots of apps that do that already. So this is more of an example of a website than it is more of a mobile application. Or is it mobile? And, well, there are different tools. So uh, you can actually, well, you can do both. You can do. Go, go to um, oh. backslash home dot, I think, HTML. I think that gives it the front. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Let's zoom out here. Cut. So, so, so sorry, Scott, Scott, yeah, you, you want to take it away? Show the concept. So, so, so real quick, the, the concept of this is just to help parents and kids stay connected when the parents are traveling. And, and the idea is that you have uh, books available and you go online and grab a book, it's a digital book, as, as a dad or mom at home, uh, you record the book as you flip through it and then you hit save and it's in the cloud and your kid is, if you're in China on business, your kid's going to bed, they hit play and then they get to see your, uh, they hear your voice and reading them the book. You know, there's a difference between, you know, when you do, you know, the different characters and all that stuff. So, so that's basically what this is, and, and I've been working with these guys. This is the wireframe for it, and, uh, and I've, I've been impressed, and the feedback has been great. When will that be available? Good question. That, that goes back to the how long does it take thing, and then the funding piece, but okay. just so everybody knows, I'm doing a Kickstarter campaign next week, uh, mm -hmm. next month, sorry, to fund this, so. We'll talk more later. Awesome. <laughs> so, what about my mom reads to me? I, I, have, I, have that I have that website, but my target audience is, is basically military uh, guys who are deploying, and the vast majority is men. So I, I apologize. <laughs> Women are welcome to use it. Grandparents are welcome to use it. Just, that's what, nobody, nobody's thought of another better name for me yet. So this is, I think what's important to know, I don't know if you guys noticed the amount of interaction. I mean, there you can click around yeah. more. Yeah, it's pull it back into that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And this is and this is you. This is a different tool than the My Balsamic. The My Balsamic one, I listed a bunch uh, on the on the presentation, but but this is actually an Azure product. So there's a different. There's a bunch of different types of wireframes. Different layouts. Can you spell different. Azure? Is A X U or e. There's some for mobile, some for games. Yes. Yeah. For okay. websites. So, so yeah, different platforms. I just know drag in the button was the end all be all. The only wireframe. Nah, no, that's. That's like my go-to though for like 90% of them. But yeah, for this, uh, we need to do something a little bit different. There's a lot of tools out there. Okay. I'd be interested to hear about your game afterwards too.
Well, it's not really a game. I, just, I use the game for a few examples because it's more specific than what you were showing. So I just try to go in the opposite yeah, direction crazy. as much as I could. That's great. <laughs> to, make, to make the point of the more severe. <laughs> All right, so, so as I said, this is one tool of many. This, I think we, I thought I have a couple more. Um, yeah, these are a couple more in here. Uh, Popapp.in pop is a good one too. And then Envision app is another really. Yeah, Brian has a great story with Envision. Yeah, Brian, and that's what you use, right? Yeah, we, we created clickable demo with that and um, we're showing it and we use that to validate our whole product. And basically it just takes screenshots and then you can put a, a tappable or clickable spot on the screenshot and link them all together so it looks like a real website. And um, we validated our product with that. In fact, when we handed it to people, I remember Chris, right? We <laughs> handed it to people and they thought it was the real application. You know, so yeah. I definitely recommend it. You guys know stuff here with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now, just a quick question about those kinds of sites. Is, is there any uh, protection issue or anything? You're, you're putting aspects of your ideas online. Um, is there any issue? No problem whatsoever. No, I don't know. Um, you know, I have, uh, yeah, I don't know. And that's probably not good. Our stuff is, uh, that we do is, is, is private, um, unless we expose it uh, out to the web. Uh, to the web. But, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's the model, right? It's private unless you push it out there. So. And, and mine, mine, I asked them to put it out there so I can right. use it as a demo and a prototype for people and showing people and getting that mm -hmm. on so. Yeah, it's a quick way to instantly show what you're talking about, and it's great. Um, so, so I want to talk about the branding piece, which is to me, I think uh, I value this like the most out of the product is the, well, not the branding piece, but it's the whole design aspect. It's making this thing, making your product look good. Like for an MVP, it's really not as important, but uh, but it's something that I've seen people waste a lot of money doing the design work piecemeal. Like a cow chip was done kind of piecemeal, and I wish I had somebody from the start. It probably wouldn't be called cow chip, um, but but uh, but somebody to help with that whole branding piece is really important. So this is where the designer designer comes in, and uh, so this is a quick aside. I actually crowdsourced this logo uh, with a 99 designs, and um, I thought this was a really good tool. But I do, I always recommend though hiring a, a designer for your team because um, even though you can do these crowdsource models, and I'll click on this. Um, this crowdsource model says, hey, Terry Byteline, pick the designer. So for 300 bucks, we had 56 designers, um, 56 designs and eight, eight designers, uh, 56 designs from eight designers. And that was the best one that we had. And you can just go through and pick all these ones, like, hey, I didn't really like that one. You know, this one actually almost made it. Sorry. I can't get it to pop up on the screen. Um, but yeah, so, um, so anyway, that was a really good tool we found. Uh, to kind of brainstorm, but it's not a substitute for having a, a developer. Yeah, I think branding and design are two almost different things. You could have, so with uh, like a 99designs type um, avenue, there's plenty of really good designers. It's like, hey, design me a cool thing. And they could, they could sit down and crank out, you know, 10 great looking things. You're like, well, hey, that looks yeah. really good, but yeah. does it address my market? So you have the, the branding component. So with the, you know, with the cow trip idea, it's like, well, Here's what I do, and here's the people I'm trying to reach. And you need to have someone that will both can design, or, or a branding person that can say, well, who are the people you're trying to reach? What do they do every day? What colors do they like? What do they wear? What do they eat for breakfast? And how that will inspire the design or respond to design. And you take those two people, or that one person that has experience in both ways, and they, they, they put all that together into something that actually responds to the person that's going to use it. So when they click on that button, they feel great. Hey, this is really neat. I look at it. I love it. Yes. I agree, and uh, and, and I but I, I I brought these together because typically what I found is that the when you, I go with the design firm like that's what they're like well we do branding too, but that branding is super important because yeah, it, it really is it becomes yeah. elemental because there are certain aspects uh, like if you've ever taken an art history class like uh, you look at classic paintings and it's it's all about iconography all those little components to a design they actually mean something uh, something could be really cool and slick and have a little gradient it's flashy it looks great hey, maybe, maybe that's a great image but uh, are there the components that speak about your brand or what you're trying to convey to your client base? And that's that's where the branding component comes in with the design. It, it, it's, it's intertwined. It, it really is. Psychology, very what resonates with your audience, all of those components. You know, like yeah. blue or orange, you know, they're yeah. both great colors, but does blue do the people who want to buy your product, they tend to be, they like blue better, you know? It's all about responding. So, you know, to speak to Ryan, we, we pull different things and sometimes that's really what you have to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it takes it takes a lot of time and energy, and I think it's a really important piece that usually gets ignored. I, I see it get ignored a lot. Yes, sir. There's one pitfall to doing the crowdsource logo design is that, especially if you use it for a while and then you go to trademark it, you may find out it's not trademarkable. So you need to see if you can determine that from the beginning or just get somebody to design something that you're sure would, would pass muster at the trademark. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, I didn't, uh, you know that when people, when you get compete in these things, cats would be like, look at this cow, this looks a lot like this other thing. And they like will link other things in. And what's, what I found to be nice is, uh, yeah, but that's still no guarantee, right? Because they're, they're kind of self-policing, but there's a lot of stuff that can get in. Um, I try to do is have them change the design while they were doing it to meet my spec, but you're right, it's the trademark piece is always, uh, that was a trick thing. Soldier lawyer. What's that? Soldier lawyer. Half a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not part of this. Yeah. <laughs> lawyers are expensive. Um, so talk about the minimal design. So typically what we do, once, you, once you've got the, the branding down, you have a logo, you have a color scheme, you have a kind of a font, you know, overall kind of layout for your site. And I've seen some really impressive ones. Um, you really want to get to this minimal design because you're trying to build a product really cheaply. What we do is limit it to five pages. We go home page, basic content page, main application page, advanced feature one and two. And that's that's all we try to do is just get, you know, kind of get some of that stuff out. And that's what you saw here. Like we would pay for this design. And once those designs were laid out, you know, then we knew what the developers kind of, it came to life for the developers. And this is like by far the cheapest way to get developers going. You don't want to say, hey, go start developing. This is what you give them. You give them this. I mean, it's pretty much everything. There's no thrashing developers have to do. They immediately start working. They know what the but they know what the requirement is. Okay, now this is where it gets very boring. But um, yeah, this, but I'll try and make it more interesting. I've got another joke. If things start to go south, the most important thing you can do once you start. Okay, so you've got the design done. We're back here. Wait, whoops. Okay, we're back here. You got the design done. You're you're ready to go but you want to get to the development piece. The, the number one thing you can do, the most important thing, is not the technical at all, but it's setting your meeting cadence. How are you guys going to meet? When are you going to meet? That's, that's your whole project. If you don't have that down, your project is going to fail. Um, so, okay. Um, what's, a, what's a meeting cadence look like? Take us through like a week. So. Take us through two weeks, I, I don't know. All right, I'll take you through. Well, let me just jump ahead to that I'll section. Push the ahead, so. Okay. So, yeah, sorry, this, this one, this picture's not my favorite, but this is the idea, though. The idea is that you have the sprint planning, right? You plan out all your groups. This is you. You, you own the product. And uh, you meet with the team. You say, this is what I want done in the week. Okay? The team meets. This is you. This team meets daily, and they're working through all the issues, and they're solving all the technical problems. You can listen in. You can attend these meetings, but you really are not allowed to. You shouldn't really be allowed to speak if you follow the agile process. Um, because this is supposed to lay everything out very clearly for the development team, um, and then they are supposed to just allow it to work for that week or the two week, depending how long you you have it. Um, and then at the end of like a one week or two week period, you'll get together with the team and they'll lay out all the work they did, and, and they'll show you. You'll say, "Hey, that's good to go." Where there'll be problems. So this is the the main development cycle meeting you guys need to have. So, any, any questions? Okay. Yeah, sure. In a, in a scrum, what is usually discussed? Or what is the process? What are the, the so, questions asked? What is, what so the is daily, yeah, so the daily call that takes place, there's three questions. Hey, what did you do yesterday? <clears throat> what are you going to do today? And what problems do you, uh, what roadblocks do you have from stopping you from work? So there's people all talk about what they're doing. If there's a roadblock, like this guy says, hey, I can't do my back end work because, you know, our account has expired on whatever, Amazon. So the developer can't do any more work. This guy's got to go solve the problem. A lot of times this guy can go up to this guy and say, hey, we need this or this. This guy solves a lot of the issues for the team. And if these guys get stuck, let's say they start developing something that takes forever, um, you know, this guy will typically come in and say, hey, you know, we've got we to change topics or we're not going to meet our deadline. We've got to fix what we're doing. Okay. All right. Let me jump back. Now, this is what you guys want. This is the, the startup stuff for non-tech. So, uh, I'm going to try, try and make this interesting. So basically what's going to happen is once you guys start, you know, you, we talked about having all your issues and you're working from, but as your developers start working, they're going to take their 
their stuff, they're going to commit all their code in here. And you use some kind of tool, here's Capistrano, which you do all your, de all, all your deployment out to your, uh, to your remote server. This happens automatically. But everything comes from the source control, which is tightly, you know, it's, it's, it's versioned, it's labeled, it's dated, it's all backed up. So everything kind of, this is the flow from issue, write code, to deployment on a server. So I'm going to talk about the technology stacks uh, very quickly. Um, this is these are the things to be aware of when you're building a startup. These are the things that you have to that you're going to have, you know, as part of your your, your application. So um, we're talking about the just some of these technology pieces right here. So we talk about the mobile user interface. This is all the HTML5, jQuery type work. This is what the browser is going to see, and you have this concept of this web application. This is where all the logic on the back end is happening, right in here. So this is where all the business aspects take place. And you also have this concept of web services uh, that are controlling, you know, if you have a mobile app, it's going to hit the web service, your web, you know, your everything's going to hit one layer. And then all the data is going to be just back here in your database. So your application doesn't hit your database at all. It goes through different tiered services to make your application more maintainable. What, what's the difference between the application and the services? So what I was trying to do with this, and this is kind of, uh, you could have swapped these around, but the web application is like, hey, this is the kind of the, the um, well, this is going to be back in the logic layer. This is more like if you're going to build like a Rails application, it's a lot of the, it's a lot of the presentation uh, layer that gets pushed out to the front. So this is kind of moving all the, this is like the, this is the backup for what's happening on the, on the user interface. So who, who decides what technology is going to be used, and, and what is the criteria for that, that decision? Um, okay, so who decides? Typically, it's the development. That's the ideal, is if it's up to the development team. But typically, we make when we make a decision, we try to make pick things that are going to be cheap and easy for the client to maintain in case they they don't want to work with us anymore. We don't want to give them something that they're locked into. So we, I mean, we work with a lot of people. Sometimes they already have a technology stack up and running, in which case we just jump in and. We start working on their their technology stack. So okay. All right. These are some of the platforms you can deploy out to: Amazon, GoDaddy, Rackspace, Heroku, Parse, <coughs> which is becoming my fast favorite right now. Um, but we typically do a lot of work on Amazon because we've been doing it for half a decade. Why do you like Parse? Um, I like Parse because it does a lot of stuff for you. Yeah, I don't have to maintain a server. So I had an Amazon server actually get hacked two nights ago. So I couldn't log anymore as root. So it was all blocked. So I had to rip it down, and then I had to rebuild the server, redeploy my code. It took about four hours. And it's just annoying to have to do that. Whereas with Parse, that stuff is all, it's a different model altogether. And then you already does a service like that, too. What's that? In the engine yard might be one that included in that list, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just haven't deployed on it, but we, you know, there's also, um, uh, yeah, there's there's a, there's a lot of other good ones. Engine Yard, that's a that's a Rails app. Rails and PHP now. I PHP. think probably got us in the already. They, they, they'll, you can do like a fractional sysadmin. Yeah. Which is pay for like hours you use. That's and, a good service. Uh, yeah, they do a good job with Rails. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to take a look at that. Engine Yard. Thanks. Um, all right, I know this is kind of boring to cover everything back here. We broke, okay. All right, we're almost done, everybody. Thank you for your patience. MVP testing, so you've built it, you've deployed it out on your servers like we talked about. You've got this MVP, you're working on it, it's, you're, you're fixing out things that you, you missed and you're, you're kind of iterating on that project. Your development really hasn't stopped yet. And then this application hardening, um, you're done, you want to just go ahead and you want to make sure that you know you're setting up your environment. So GitHub's all your source code, but you've got a development server, test server, and production server. You want to make sure you're backing up all your data to uh, some kind. Of, this is Amazon <coughs> S3, just to just to store everything. But you want these separate servers because developers are always going to be doing things down here, and then the test machine is okay. Once the developers are done, you're going to look at it, and make sure it's perfect um, in the QA effort. They're going to say, okay, it's perfect. Then it gets pushed out, and this is a very common version, right? Very common model. Okay, that's it. Congratulations, you made it. That's the end of the that's the end of the talk. So, I don't know if that's a VC or not. That's that's the end. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? Uh, how about you, sir?
Um, on your, I guess, review of the different technologies for like the web apps versus the uh, services and stuff, you had certain things circled, and I was wondering why. Oh, uh, because that's what I did with Cowtrip. Okay. Yeah, I don't use that stack for everything. Well, no. gotcha. So. So one of the things I think teams sometimes undervalue is like the actual collaboration and talking and sharing data and things. Um, and I, I mentioned Jira, obviously, a lot of things, a nice software suite. Um, some of it's actually really cheap. But uh, what's your experience or recommendations for the team? So I think people drop into the, I'll email you that newest version, and then it becomes, what do you mean you were coding against that? I sent you the other one, or this kind of disconnect, which can then just kill momentum. Yeah, we try not to use email at all. Right. Uh, we end up using um, uh, Basecamp for kind of our, our core you know, communication. And Basecamp is kind of a nice, um, I don't want to bore you guys more, but it's a really nice tool uh, for startups. And let's see if Tony's logged in. Um, and what it does is it just allows you to see all the communication across all your projects. Um, and then of course Jira is where we do all of our tracking and for the developers, they stay in Jira and kind of higher layer out is Basecamp. And these are just tool suites that we, uh, Yes. Trello? What's that? It's, it's sort of like Trello. Yeah. No, I haven't used that one yet. Trello is like the, the scrum board, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. So we do that in Jira. We use the okay. same thing, though. Okay. Um, so I, I, I don't know, can I interject here? Yeah. So with tools, I, we use Basecamp a lot for a lot of discussions. It's simple. Um, working with the clients, it's just really easy to pick up. I, I know Scott has, has raved about it. Um, yeah. Now, when we get an actual, in, in GitHub is where we keep all the source code. We worry about the versions and things that you talk about there. Um, and, and then uh, Jira is really what we use to track our issues, plan our scrums, do our sprints. We break everything down into a, a ticket. Um, and and Terry, I think it's pretty interesting to talk about what's it like to work with developers? Is, is, you know, they're, we say they're finicky, but not, and not in a bad way, but could you elaborate some there, I guess? Or? Yeah, I mean, developers, I mean, some are just really cool. Some are very much like introverted. So it's a, it's a very wide spectrum, but uh, the best ones are the ones that are you know talkative and, and share their knowledge. But typically, yeah, I mean, you you don't want guys who are super talk. I don't know, it's very subjective. You want guys that are t that can communicate well and express their ideas, but yeah. uh, it's not guys working with the focus. sales team. I guess it's a little different. Yeah, it's a little bit different work so with the sales team. Base camp stuff if you do want to show that. Oh, is it? Uh, no, nope. I think your I think the internet's down. Oh well. I saw some nice yawns in the crowd. He tells the other joke. It's going south. <laughs> <laughs> that was the joke. How did the pirate stop smoking? Anybody? He used the patch. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, so. You Googled pirate jokes. <laughs> I did. I Googled them last night. That's right. Um, anyway, so this is, yeah, base camp. There's just. It's just, I was going to show the progress one, which is my favorite view, but, uh, but it's not, it's just really slow right now. So, okay, does anybody have any other questions? How about a case study? Or, yeah, go ahead, Brandon, uh, sorry. It's kind of like him, he asked a lot of questions, <laughs> and he asked a good one, too. Well, yeah, so I'm kind of at the point in my site's design where, like, I hired an awesome single developer, and he did, like, the back end and the UI. And then before that, the page was designed by a designer, like uh, an art director type, but also the what the web stuff. And so, you know, when we were working together during startup phase, you know, we had a launch date set in mind, we had all these things planned out, and we met them. And now it's like, okay, we've had our initial launch, and we've been out there for a couple of years, and now we want to add some features and stuff. You know, what would you say the spectrum is for maybe trying to hire on somebody else to pick up where he left off. Like what is that what does that timeline look like? Is it you know, I guess it depends on the experience of whatever firm or person you're looking at, but what have you seen in your experience? Like going in and saying, like, okay, we're gonna add feature X, Y, and Z to this baseline to for the customer. Um, it's just this is initial ramp up, right? So a new guy comes in and he's got to you know learn. Okay, what was this guy? It's actually really hard to do that. Yeah, um, I, I do that and uh, done that for a long time. To basically have to reverse people, reverse engineer everyone's code to figure out what they were thinking. If you use Rails, what's nice about Rails is 
it's you know it's done pretty standard, so you can figure stuff out. But um, it just takes it just takes time to get comfortable with it. It's not a, it's not, it's not a good answer. I mean, but, uh, like what? So what I ended up doing is, you know, now he's like married, bought a house. And yeah, so he's full done. Job also, <laughs> um, which is cool, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> Not for you. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, but at the same time, like I can't afford to drop like thousands of dollars at once for like a big yeah. to do stuff either. Yeah. So it kind of worked out where I was like, hey, you know, well, I'll give you up to this much per month for you know these tasks or this much progress on whatever tasks. Yeah. Like, great. You thought about hiring like a college student, say like at a local university, that, mm -hmm. that might help you with the budget. Yeah, I mean, I thought about that, but I. He came back and he said, you know, hey, you know, I, I can you know, help you for like, you know, he gave me his limits on like commitment time and, and his, you know, rate obviously went up and he's like got a bigger role, a bigger role in his other like, nine five jobs. So. But at the same time, he knows what he wrote, so he knows exactly how to implement stuff. So, you know, I just wanted to see what you guys have seen in the past in terms of like picking up and it's is it just because like people don't comment or code or is it, is it just really hard to understand even with all that stuff? Yeah, I told commenting is you know, it's not really worth anything. Oh really? Okay. I think it's almost like anything like like I know you do cars, mechanic work. You know, if somebody takes an engine apart, they knew where all the parts were and you have to do so much more work just to get to wherever it is they left off. Um, or accounting, you know, the last bookkeeper, you don't know what they did. You got to almost, you know, clear. You have to relearn you know, everything and yeah, yeah. set a baseline up. So you're you're doing what they did and then starting. So there's a there's a big learning curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That what, what is your exist. app that is so simple that you only have to have occasional help on later? What what do you what do you uh, it's, it's like it's kind of like one of those things where I have a nine to five job too. You know, it's not like I'm depending on it, but it's a peer to peer. A tool renting and lending marketplace. Um, it's PHP and MySQL. Yeah. Um, it's pretty simple. I guess you could call it kind of like a more user friendly phrase. Okay. You know, and it's it's not just point of sale though. So there's a lot more back end stuff. Like money goes to like all these different places, and there's refunds and deposits that get sent everywhere. Right. Sounds yeah, like, like a, sounds like a piece of cake. It's like a nice <laughs> custom PayPal like handshake all over. So, so, yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, we thought about maybe selling the platform, like, because we've seen other guys try to do, like, crowdsource, like, camera equipment, but that's where it's trash. Um, so, that's another thing, you know, license the software. And all, so that yeah, I don't know how to do that, because I would sell Caltra. So, if you figure that <laughs> out, let <laughs> me know how you do that. Uh, and this is a picture that I almost drew, but I, I guess I ran out of time. Uh, I took down like my, my calendar once. I was trying to you know figure out when I could meet with people, and I put down like you know my you know I have I have one you know one particular client that I'm very heavily engaged in, and I mapped out like on a on a on a Google Calendar. I put, actually put all my available time, and there was like almost no time in it. So like so when someone's like you know a developer like hey I I think I can do that. It'd almost be fascinating to see what that that full calendar looks like, yeah. because it's not it's a lot less time than you than you think. But it's very seductive for a developer to say, yeah, I can work on that startup. Yeah. Very seductive, but it's. I mean, like we, we did a, you know, like a Google Docs spreadsheet of tasks. Like this yeah. is the task yeah. that I want to have done. Mm -hmm. What's your estimate on time? Um, what are your notes, questions, comments, concerns, so that I can provide feedback? And he's come back, and you know, it's like, okay, this feature will take an hour. This will be like yeah. several hours. Yeah, that has worked out great for us. So it has. Yeah. Um, you know, he'll come back. I mean, he'll be like, okay, well, I have like an hour or two a week this time, this week or something. And then yeah. Maybe next week when his big project work ends, he's got the time. So like that. So um, hmm. it's it's worked out pretty well. And since like I'm kind of paying him piecemeal anyway, you know, I don't have to say like a huge chunk of change. Maybe it's not the best for like getting to market as fast as possible, but it's manageable. Yeah. It's a niche market and like nobody else really does it. So Yeah. yeah. It's great. It's bootstrapping. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's you gotta make it happen and right. just keeping things alive mm -hmm. and slowly incrementally developing that's huge. So that's <coughs>
when you're dealing with in the mobile app environment, mm -hmm. um, let's say if you're doing something for iPhone first, mm -hmm. how how much time or you know is it to switch it over to Android or add all those additional files? Um, it depends, but usually it's a lot faster to do the second app. Once you've gone through all design and you're like, oh, we really like this iOS app. Um, I, I, so it depends on the complexity, but it, it, it's a lot, it's a lot quicker. Um, and Google Glass, have you all investigated that? Uh, I, I, yes, I at one point tried to buy a <laughs> pair, but yeah. I just, but I, I held off on it. I think that would be Google Glass would be awesome, yeah. but uh, I haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. so. I was curious, what challenges are there uh, when uh, doing a mobile app since the technology changes? Uh, a lot more frequently, I think, than than the browser technology. Are there any considerations people need to think about before? Like when something changes that? from like iOS six to seven. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. So I mean, hopefully the, the the platform when they do that upgrade, those changes are minimal that need to take place in order to be compliant. So um, yeah, my answer is still not very good, but uh, but it's I mean you, we have to follow so. We, and we basically, we'll just make the changes that we need and kind of. I was thinking more in terms of from the business owner's perspective, in terms of do we um, invest in this because will yeah. we be able to afford and will it make sense? You know, what's the price point for for developing it now when it may be obsolete in a little bit? I guess I was thinking along those lines. Maybe it's uh, is I don't know what those mean. There's, <laughs> a, there's a podcast uh, that's on the iTunes Store called Build and Analyze. Called what? Build and Analyze. Uh, the guy that did it uh, was the co-founder of Tumblr. He created a company called, or an app called Instapaper, which was like one of the original PIP iPhone apps that first came out. He talks about his in and outs of like building the mobile app, and then he also talks about like that specific issue in a lot of detail, like the, the decision to focus on iPhone iOS for an iPhone app instead of doing iOS and an Android app. Oh, gotcha. He, he built the iOS himself. He's a developer, but he hired a firm or had a firm work with him to build the Android app. But if you're, if you're interested in learning more about that, that podcast is really, really good. It talks about like, all kinds of neat stuff. Okay. So, I, I, I could mention from, from that standpoint, I did a lot of my testing early on before actually building anything. I had about 75% mm -hmm. of the people that came to the site, which was just a landing page or iOS. So from a business perspective, I mean, that's that's a huge, huge, yeah. especially when I'm limited on money and I start looking, no, we're not looking there yet, but when you start looking at where am I going to go first, obviously it's iOS versus Android or something like that. So. If I'll put them over the space, um, given that startup budgets are light, uh, do you ever recommend some of the uh, cross-cut platforms yeah. like Titanium or Purdue or jQuery Mobile? Um, it comes to generate the native apps, right? I struggle with that one because it's, you know, once again, it's a very seductive path to go down. But, I mean, it still requires development effort to build that. And, and you know, where I get stuck is, you know, is if you get stuck with that platform and you can't solve whatever technical problem it is, then you're, you're, kind, of, uh, then you're kind of stuck. Because then you have to build it natively anyway. So, um, depends what you're doing. If you're building a simple retrieve app, then it makes sense to, to really investigate that route and go down that route. But if you're making a, hey, I want to you you know heavily use the GPS uh, unit and I want to conserve power, I want to really maximize you know how often I report back, and you're just doing a lot of you know native app, that's you know that's the route to go down as, as you know as close as you can get to the metal as you can. Okay, great. Cool. Well, yeah, with your respect for everything, it's a great topic, a lot of great questions. You got um, really good stuff. And, um, you know, no, Terry, it wasn't boring at all. Uh, yeah. 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 You know, at Service Snap, Chris and I, we work with Byline. I recommend them highly. If you're looking to get something developed, come talk to these guys. No kidding. Um, so, um, again, the next uh, event is November 21st, so make sure to mark off the calendar. Um, anyone else? Anything else? Anybody thought of any other events? Anything else good going on? I'm trying to think. I know that um, Accelerate Baltimore is accepting applications. We were in the Accelerator last year. If you have a startup or you have a great idea, you should pitch it there. Um, enter. It's free to enter. And um, you can get, uh, we got $25,000 and we got office space and tons of great mentorship through the program. So 
if you got something, plot. Um, I think there's another one on the Eastern Shore. You, yep. Can you tell us anything about that? Or do you know? I just I just read through the application, um, but if you are on the Eastern Shore looking to move your business in that area, there's a competition going on right now. I believe first place it's like thirty-five thousand. Yeah. Second ten thousand. Business third, plan competition. 5, 000, yeah. So. And you get automatically put into the. Um, yes. To the, the I think the third. Maryland? Yeah. And yeah. To like the quarterfinals yeah. or something automatically. If you yeah. So if you're on the Eastern Shore, you should definitely. It's, do that. it's definitely a good deal. And um, then there's Entrepreneur Expo coming up. Yep. In, in um, who's organizing the Eastern Shore? Um, I'm not sure. Do you remember? Yeah. I got the, I got an email, but I don't remember where it came from. I think someone at the ETC, the Emerging Technology Center, sent it. But I don't they think they're organized. I think a lot of people were sending yeah. out. I don't know who's actually organizing. Yeah. But um, okay. I'm trying oh. to think if there's anything else. Kevin, Will, where's Will? Thank you. It was excellent. I would love to get. I think Ryan would echo it. We want more people to be willing to pitch your company. So please stand up. It doesn't matter what stage you're at. Even if it's just. A, an idea you're looking to get feedback on, let us know, email Ryan or I, or find us after sometime, um, we'll get you right in, and I think it's some great exposure, and it'd be much appreciated, so. Right, and then, I'm sorry, yeah. co-working, or have you already? Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about it last time, but yeah, we're yeah. organizing a co-working space if you um, are interested, uh, for Annapolis, so if you're interested, or you have some feedback, or anything like that, just come talk to us. Um, we're kind of in the early stages of forming that, so if you're interested, let us know. Um, I think that's it. We, we uh, want to be respectful of everybody's time. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.